Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, this is the start of the next session of the uh, networked archaeology theme, which we'll be focusing on a series of presentations related to the Crane Project. like to proceed with a bit of an overview, um, an introduction, if you will, or to the ongoing research of the Crane Project. And let me say a few uh, introductory remarks, and then I will proceed to a brief overview of some of the active projects, and uh, then we'll proceed with the papers for the rest of the session, which will be more focused on specific aspects of some of this uh, Crane-sponsored uh, research. The rapid proliferation of digital data and Near Eastern archaeology has created an unprecedented opportunity to create collaborative research initiatives with the capacity to investigate complex questions such as the long-term impacts of climate change and anthropogenic activity at finely grained and localized scales of analysis within discrete subregions of the ancient Near East. The Crane Project is a multidisciplinary consortium of archaeologists, uh, climate and paleoenvironmental scientists, and computer scientists that seek to facilitate such a collaborative research environment. In what we are now referring to as Crane 1.0, we focused on the Orontes watershed, a cohesive geographical unit and region uniquely situated as a cultural microcosm of the larger, broader ancient Near East as an initial operational test case. The success of this initial partnership has positioned us now for what we're referring to as Crane 2.0 designed to facilitate more systematic investigations. I have to, to enter again, because if you are going ahead with the slides, we are stuck on the first slide. I haven't advanced them yet. I will advance them when I'm ready. OK, thank you. I'm sorry. The success of this initial partnership has positioned Crane to facilitate more systematic investigations of the complex interplay between human communities and their environment in the Eastern Mediterranean and broader Middle East. This session will present a series of papers, as I mentioned, on a series of, of a number of these ongoing collaborative projects, uh, both with uh, in Crane as well as with other large collaborative research groups and some of their initial results that we have achieved to date, with our primary aim today of demonstrating the analytical potential and utility of this collaborative approach. So uh, since time is now, I've lost a good bit of time. I'm going to move quickly here. Some of this is pretty straightforward. The, of course, uh, staggering proliferation of digital data that has been uh, true of our field and diverse, profoundly diverse uh, different types of data sets has essentially overwhelmed our systems if we haven't uh, been begun to develop some kind of collaborative way of navigating and managing this type of uh, exploding and pro proliferating data. And if we aren't able to develop some of these kinds of larger collaborative structures, we risk the problem of data graveyards, which I think many of us have already experienced to be true, where large data sets from various projects are being digitized into some format and then often put onto the internet and essentially um, lost uh, or forgotten, or at least not used to their full potential. For the sake of time, many of these um, objectives of the Crane Project are already, I think, somewhat well known. Initially, as I said, with Crane 1.0, the integration of these different data sets from multiple archeological research projects using different terminologies, often different languages, coming from many different research traditions. The desire was to try and create a core, at the same time, a core cultural and paleoenvironmental sequence, focusing initially on the Orontes watershed. The creation also of protocols and analytical tools that could help us facilitate broad access to this proliferating body of digital information. And then also the simulation of ancient social practices and related human environment dynamics based on parameters supplied by this growing body of empirical data as well as the creation of spatially accurate and realistic uh, 3D visualizations 
and reconstructed ancient landscapes, as well as human activity based on empirical data, not just simply on theorized and idealized types of uh, simulations. And then finally, also of central importance to us has been trying to create research opportunities as well as training for in advanced archaeological and computational data science and, and methods for students and early career scholars. So as I've already mentioned, and for the sake of time, I'm just going to go very quickly through this. We initiated uh, research um, during Crane 1.0 along the Orontes watershed um, and began integrating data from a series of sites in uh, mostly Syria, Western Syria, and in Southeastern Turkey. This ongoing data integration has involved data sets from Tainat, uh, Zinjuli, and it is the full range of archaeological data, stratigraphy, pottery, fauna, botanical, and many uh, different types of uh, digital or, or uh, computational formats, text, images, geospatial shapefiles, etc. It has also involved um, data from Asharna, from Karkamesh, from Homs so Regional Survey, Kahraman Marash. Mastuma, Tel Nabimen, Karkur, Katna, and Zinjuli. We have worked heavily with a number of different platforms, most, um, most actively with the Ochre system that um, is an extensible uh, system that enables us to uh, work with our different and introduce data from our different uh, recording systems and, uh, syst and is very um, adaptable. Um, working from a core ontology that it can adopt to and incorporate lots of this type of data coming from different systems. As the Crane project has grown, as you will begin to see more as the session uh, proceeds, we have also worked uh, closely with um, many other uh, uh, computational uh, database management systems and as well as the OCRA system. Thus far, in terms of the data integration effort, uh, working with primarily students at the University of Toronto. This involves both PhD, MA, and undergraduates, a number now approaching 50 and more than uh, 10,000 hours. Just a picture of uh, some of our students at work, some of the different data sets that have been entered that you see here. And it's a growing, it's a constantly expanding uh, body of data that has now gone well beyond the Orontes watershed, including projects from uh, both North and Southern Levant and um, even beyond. Here you get a sense of some of the different types of data that we have been able to incorporate into this highly integrated uh, data system. And to give you just a sense in terms of quantitative numbers, um, just over the last uh, few years, this has been going on uh, less than a half, of, about five or six years now. Um, we have now over 123,000 um, bits of actual archaeological data um, from these different projects, um, keeping in mind that all of this data has uh, many, many different links and connections. And so we're talking many million millions of relational um, details in this larger database. You can see here just an example from Telesharne of the basic um, window of what the data structure looks like. An example from Tynot. Just don't have time to go into any of the detail here. And then I think perhaps most importantly now as we've begun to move into uh, Crane 2.0 has been trying to grapple with the longer term data preservation and data stewardship. And we've been able to work into an agreement with the University of Toronto Libraries, which is one of the largest uh, libraries in North America, which has as one of its core mandates a commitment towards the um, permanent um, repository and stewarding of data migrating across um, um, whatever kinds of technological platforms may evolve as well as um, preserving that data in perpetuity with geographic redundancy. That means that the data is stored in multiple locations, um, somewhat jokingly, but very seriously, they talk about it as um, a commitment to the nuclear scenario. In other words, if there should be some kind of um, catastrophic event that they would still be able to have the data preserved. So this kind of permanence and this permanent commitment to the stewardship of this data is a crucial um, 
uh, part of what we have been working towards. And now we have begun the process of developing the, the structure for the archiving and stewarding of that data, working closely with the team. Um, they have made an open-ended commitment. So this data will be stored in perpetuity um, with this kind of commitment that I've described. And it will also protect the, um, the various kinds of um, access concerns that and agreements that come with any of the data that has been contributed to this larger uh, data structure and data system. All data files are logged, all formats are monitored for compatibility and obsolescence issues. And here you just get one example of the first test case that we've begun working on. That's data from the Telesharni project of uh, Michel Fortin. And you can see the volume of what has already been generated. Um, storage capacity is not really an issue here. I mean, they've already committed over 40 um, uh, terabytes, but uh, the, the, the long-term commitment is an open one. And this is something that we hope will facilitate the ongoing um, growth of this highly integrated data system that we have been trying to uh, establish. You can perhaps imagine uh, the, the proliferation of some of these so-called data graveyards that I talked about, largely legacy data. This is something that we um, are trying to provide a facility that will help uh, archive, preserve, and then steward that data in a um, ethical and manner, observing and, and respecting the um, whatever may have been associated with the um, collection and um, proprietary concerns of that of the people who excavated that data. We have also built up a something known as the ceramic repository for the Rantes. This is the legacy of the Rantes watershed, uh, Crown Crane uh, 1.0, um, which now has, um, as you can see here, quite a large body of material um, with uh, at least 10,000 images and uh, pottery from uh, at least 28 different sites thus far, as well as um, almost 20,000 spatial units, uh, more than 16,000 registered pottery sherds and um, about 3,000 pottery drawings and um, 7,000 images. You can see here just a very quick glimpse, a uh, screenshot of the structure of that. And then related to that, we've been working very hard on trying to develop algorithms to help with shape matching so that we can begin to uh, connect types with this growing uh, digital archive. And we've been working very closely with an advanced team uh, of computer scientists, including here you can see Andy Chow, who's um, had a real breakthrough and he's a PhD student in computer science, uh, working with uh, Eugene Fiumi. And they have uh, begun developing using the shape descriptor that you see here, a very compelling system that has helped to deal with essentially one of the primary challenges of shape matching with pottery. And that is the subjectiveness of many of the associations. And uh, using this shape descriptor, you can see here very quickly a kind of um, illustration of how this would work, the overlay of a profile of a, let's in this case, a rim shirt um, across this uh, descriptor and the various points of contact. And then the algorithm uh, and formula that has been developed, referred to here as a similarity measure that has really um, produced very, very high and accurate results addressing this uh, subjectiveness issue. Related to this is also what we refer to as the noise issue, which is that there's a lot of background, often distractive kinds of information that might be on an image that um, can obscure the uh, match. And this uh, procedure and similarity measure seems to address that very, very well. The third one was practicality, trying to be able to process large numbers of potential matches. And I can say that I think we are satisfied with the results. Um, our computer scientist colleagues have been a little bit uh, um, reluctant to go uh, into all of this because they feel they want to have an even faster uh, querying, but they can actually process thousands of possible matches in just a few seconds. We're now also interested in trying to add uh, to shape other attributes like color, texture, and so forth. And these are things that we hope to begin working on in the near future, as well as micro more like you see here of thin sections of pottery. Related to this is yet another project, a shape matching project um, involving sculptural material. It's a three-dimensional project that we're um, already beginning to uh, work using the thousands of fragments from the tie nut uh, sculptures that we have found. 
and hope to be able to report on more success with this approach and technique in the near future. Uh, there's been a fueling experimental project that I don't have time to go into detail here, but I just wanted to highlight that it involves both uh, testing different type of fuel sources. This has been led by a team at Durham University by uh, Kamal Badrashani and also includes experimental uh, potting uh, methods. And so far has begun to produce very, very interesting results in terms of the different kinds of possibilities around uh, choices of fuels and so forth. Regional mapping is yet another part of the crane project. We've reported on some of this in the past, and so I'm just going to have to skip by this. But we have uh, many thousands. Uh, I think it's about four to 5,000 uh, sites. These have contributed to various larger uh, cultural heritage initiatives, such as the Syrian Heritage Initiative, and also most recently, the ongoing uh, conflict uh, in the immediate Idlib area, which is, uh, of course, in the encompasses the Orontes watershed. 3D visualizations, something that we've done extensively and have reported on before. I just want to highlight now, um, my colleague Jacobo Manastero will be giving a more detailed um, presentation later in the session on the Carcamish 3D GIS, which is an exciting development out of this or related to this. And the second one, which um, is that led by Scott Branting at University of Central Florida, the Datch, which involves a uh, um, very exciting um, use of um, the virtual reality to map in very high precision data, like you can see here, a section being drawn of their excavations at Kerkenes uh, in central Turkey. Now, with the very uh, few minutes I have left, I want to focus really on, on what will be the setup, hopefully, for what we are going to be here about in, in the next papers coming forward. That is the development of a high precision regional chronological framework. This initiative is being led by Stuart Manning, and we'll hear more from him shortly, so I, I won't take time now to go into this, but it's an extremely important and exciting aspect of uh, what's been coming out of this collaboration with Endocrine uh, research uh, effort. And then related to that is also a recognition of the need for um, considerable larger numbers of cores um, and, and, and paleoenvironmental sequences. Um, a very complex story, um, often, of course, constrained by the um, very difficult situations, for example, obviously in Syria, but in other parts of the Middle East. But I am happy to say that we have now uh, cores that have been taken in uh, parts of the Orontes watershed, but also most recently, just very, very recently, um, earlier this uh, year, I believe, in uh, southern Iraq, um, uh, led by a team um, coming out of uh, Durham University. And uh, we'll hope to hear more about those results in the near future. And uh, there are other coring initiatives that would be taking place in Lebanon and also in Israel. And so a, a growing body of data that will contribute to pale environmental reconstruction as well. And I want to just give a, flag, a highlight to uh, Doa Kawakaya, um, who's been uh, leading a really exciting group of growing efforts to gather uh, uh, botanical data, paleoethnobotany. Um, for this Eastern Mediterranean, particularly Orontes watershed. And that has also included isotope analysis, some of which we may hear a little bit about later to, in this session. And then uh, finally, the uh, modeling work of our colleagues uh, we'll hear about in the next paper. Um, again, something that I don't have time to go into detail here, but is an extremely important effort to try and build a large, um, very um, high precision regional climate model building out of the uh, larger global climate model uh, work that's been done, um, which has a resolution usually in the 100 to 200 kilometer uh, square kilometer grid. So these regional climate models uh, give a much, much uh, greater or coarser resolution than the GCMs can provide uh, through the principle of downscaling. And you can see the effect of higher resolution illustrated um, in the lower right hand uh, corner. Our goal with this RCM, you can see in the slide on the right, is to zoom into the Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean region, and to produce this uh, regional climate model um, with resolutions that are downscaled to at least the 10 kilometers uh, uh, unit. We believe it will be possible even ultimately to um, move that even to um, greater resolution than that in time. But our goal for now is to build this uh, RCM at a 10 kilometer uh, resolution. And this is in a, as moving along at a great uh, pace right now, and we'll hear more about that shortly. 
And then finally, agent-based modeling, which uh, Lynn Welton has uh, continued from our colleague, John Christensen uh, from Argonne, who passed away sadly a couple of years ago and, has, and she will be presenting about that. So I don't need to say anything more about that right now, but some very exciting and important results coming out of this uh, effort. And related to that has been the beginning of a collaboration with some of these other larger regional or global, in this case, the Land Cover 6K collaboration. Um, we have been able to uh, participate as a small partner, providing data, uh, zooarchaeological data, as well as uh, settlement pattern data to this larger global um, project. And here's just a very quick tease of some of the work that Lynn Welton, Dan Lawrence, and his team at Durham and Emily Hammer at, at Pennsylvania have been doing in contributing to this larger global uh, uh, landscape use and settlement uh, project. I do have one last project I want to mention that is kind of a fun and exciting one. We heard about those of you who were on the session uh, yesterday. Uh, Dominic Lange Barsetti has uh, been working with a number of our colleagues at the Royal Ontario Museum and also um, elsewhere, developing um, pedagogical tools using the um, highly popular Minecraft uh, system. And uh, you would have heard about that hopefully in the session yesterday. If not, uh, there's an article that just came out in the recent issue of the Near Eastern Archaeology that describes it as well. A very exciting outreach dimension to the larger crane project. So I will stop with that um, and uh, just want to, in conclusion, acknowledge the uh, really large and growing team of collaborators, uh, re students, researchers that are part of the Korean research community. Um, what I've just given a very quick taste of is um, hardly does justice to the incredible work of this growing uh, community of scholars and a demonstration, I hope, of the utility of this kind of collaborative approach. Thank you very much.